So how many people know, have heard of VMware, know what the company does? Yeah, relatively few, so it's not surprising to me. So uh, VMware is the, actually the market leader in virtualization and cloud software for the enterprise. And so you may wonder, why is VMware at ISC, or you know, I've also been at supercomputing. Well, so in fact, um, I'm not a virtualization person, I'm actually an HPC person. Uh, I've been at VMware about two years now, as I mentioned, leading an HPC effort. My background is really all HPC. I've been, uh, spent a lot of time at both Sun Microsystems and at Thinking Machines. And so um, what I've been doing is looking at uses of virtualization and cloud technology for HPC and what needs to be done to enable that to happen. And uh, you know, the title and, and the main purpose of the talk is to really uh, present some preliminary data about when we can use cloud computing technology for things other than throughput embarrassingly parallel applications, which I think at this point it's been shown pretty definitively that those kinds of applications uh, run quite well uh, in, a, in a cloud environment. Okay, so before I actually talk about the, um, the low latency results, uh, I do want to talk for a few minutes about some trends that I think, or at least I hope, will explain to you why you should care why a company like VMware uh, event like this one. And, and similarly, you've, you've been seeing companies like Google and Amazon and others showing up at these events, and I think um, we're coming for similar sorts of reasons. So let's talk about that. So if you look at the sort of state of the world right now, and say for the last almost 20 years or so, uh, the enterprise IT stacks, the, the, the software that's been deployed in enterprise environments to to uh, provision data centers, to manage data centers, to monitor data centers, it's been a, is pretty much distinct when, from what we use in the HPC community. And I think that a lot of that stemmed from uh, the advent of the Beowulf clusters in the mid-90s where the HPC community really decided as a whole that going uh, distributed was going to be important for the future of HPC. And that was obviously a good decision. That was the only way that we were able to get to the kind of high scale that was required for running uh, large, difficult problems in HPC. But by making that step, we took a divergence from the sort of mainstream IT approaches for building data centers. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, and, and John alluded to this um, earlier in his, um, in his talk about trends. So on the you know, when we took the step to Beowulf, we, we took a hit in terms of application efficiency and performance. And it's been a long time, uh, it's taken us a long time to climb back up and deliver reasonably good efficiencies with MPI applications in HPC cluster environments. What hasn't happened is that we have not improved the management experience uh, in an HPC environment. And if you talk to IDC or any of the other analysts, they're still every year, and they'll say this probably tomorrow at their, at their breakfast event, it's still the case that the single biggest pain point for uh, HPC environments is cluster management. And that I think kind of falls out of this. And one of the, one of the things to think about is that this diagram is actually not drawn to scale. So, I mean, we tend to think of HPC as our world, right? Well, if you look at actually drawn to scale, it's more like this. Oh, you can't, oh, you can see it. It's sort of messed up, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I'm not quite sure why that's, showing that way. Anyway, what you're seeing there is uh, Ganymede and, uh, well, I hope you're seeing it, and, um, and Jupiter. So the enterprise IT market is so much larger than the HPC market. It's, it's really pretty incredible. I think all in analysts say that HPC is around a $25 billion market. That's all hardware, all software, support, services, everything. It's about $25 billion. Whereas the IT market is more, it, it's really difficult for me to find a number. It's maybe more like 800 billion or a trillion dollars. It's really not quite clear to me. This was actually brought home to me in a really kind of personal way when I first joined VMware. So I've been going to supercomputing since the late 80s. Uh, VMware has a, an event that we run every year called VMworld, which is just our conference that we run for our customers and our partners. I attended that, I've attended that event twice since I started at VMware. There are over 20,000 people at that conference. It's bigger than all of supercomputing, all, everything that we bring together as a community. Um, it was really quite incredible, incredible to me to see that, that, um, that difference in scale, and it's really carried forward in the, 
in the, um, the market sizes as well. So, so why does that matter? It matters because if you look at the amount of money and effort and resources that vendors are willing to put into a market, it's directly proportional to the size of that market. And so if you kind of look at what's happened in the HPC space over the last 20 years or so, the, as I said, the stacks are different for HPC and for enterprise. If you look at any of the major vendors, the tier one vendors, um, system vendors, you'll see that they have software infrastructure that they deploy in an enterprise environment uh, for dealing with the uh, HPC side. HPC tends to be more a mixture of open source and some components added by the vendor. Um, so there's a huge amount of effort and an ability to deal, deal with and solve very large difficult problems on the enterprise that really hasn't been applied on the HPC side. And so that normally probably wouldn't matter to the HPC community because the enterprise folks are doing their thing and HPC, we're doing our thing. But it turns out there's actually somewhat of a convergence happening here. And the convergence is really being driven by some shared concerns. And actually, I think this is generally really good news for the HPC community. Because it turns, so, and, and for the reasons I just mentioned, if there are shared concerns and problems that we have on the HPC side, then they're almost certainly going to be addressed in a big way by uh, the vendors that are playing in the enterprise space because it's so much larger. So just some of them are mentioned here, and I'll, I'll just call out a few. And some of them are kind of interesting. So scale-out management. Now, we've had bragging rights for a really long time as a community about having the largest systems on the planet, right? But we've lost that, right? If you, and if you go and look at the data centers that Google and Facebook and Amazon are deploying, they're not totally upfront about the size of those deployments, but they're, you know, we're talking about probably millions of processors in those, uh, in those uh, sites. So admittedly, they're used for a different kind of workload. They're more for throughput oriented, although they are running an increasing number of distributed parallel applications as well, things like Pragle, things like um, Hadoop in the big data space. Um, but in terms of IT, in terms of deploying, managing, monitoring your uh, data center uh, infrastructure, they far eclipsed what we're doing, even with the largest systems in the HPC space. Uh, others that I'll call out, so low latency communication, that's something clearly that we care a lot about, and that's the, 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 the topic of this presentation. This is something that's actually emerging in the enterprise as being increasingly important as well for things like scale-out databases, in-memory databases. There are a variety of scale-out middleware components that are being built in the enterprise um, and for the cloud that really do benefit from low latency. And in fact, in the virtualization platform that we build, it's, it itself has a set of distributed services that we've shown pretty definitively benefit from things like RDMA. So there are a lot of reasons why looking at things like technologies like RDMA are important for dealing with future enterprise requirements. And that's good news for, for the HPC community. Uh, others, power management is something that we traditionally didn't care about in the HPC space, but we clearly care a lot more about that now. Uh, application parallelism and resiliency are both things that we've traditionally cared a lot about. Well, we've cared about parallelism on the HPC side. We haven't cared too much about resiliency, and it's been the flip for enterprise. Uh, they've paid a lot of attention to resiliency with most of the models that they've built and uh, not too much attention to parallelism, but multi-core processors are really driving the enterprise people to start looking at parallelism as well. So this all combines, to, I think, to create um, a, a good thing, potentially a good thing for the HPC community. If we can figure out ways to leverage what's being done in the, in the mainstream um, enterprise IT space. Now, with respect to cloud, just so, to sort of drive that home a little bit. So Forrester um, estimates that the cloud market is going to be about $241 billion by 2020. So the question is, what cloud are they talking about, right? Are they talking about HPC cloud or what? Well, I think the answer should be obvious now. It's whatever the 800-pound gorilla wants it to be, right? So enterprise IT is going to drive the requirements for what a cloud looks like. But one of the reasons I joined VMware was to really work to influence the company in a direction that makes it more HPC friendly. So from my side, I'm pushing that. Again, this convergence of requirements makes that a lot easier to do. If I were to go into our engineering and management teams and make a case for going after just the HPC market, which, as I said, is around $25 billion versus the $800 billion enterprise market, that kind of argument doesn't fly. But I've been able to find converged arguments for pretty much everything that we require in HPC. Maybe not to the level that's needed by the very, very high-end HPC customers, but 
if you look at the market, the HPC market overall, the bulk of the market, I believe, can ultimately be uh, served by these sorts of technologies. So what you'll see is um, mainstream cloud and virtualization technologies being more and more applicable starting at the bottom of the market and kind of moving up over time. Okay, um, so I, you know, I, we've talked about cloud. Uh, I just want to make a, a brief mention that you know, obviously virtualization gets you into a cloud environment. But that's not the only reason, uh, and we've had a lot of discussions with our customers that have HPC workloads. There are a lot of things you can do with virtualization that aren't just related to getting into the cloud. So for example, uh, being able to run whatever software stack it is that you'd like to, to run, as opposed to being restricted to what a site has determined will be the distro that's, that's installed on its compute cluster. So you have an ability to customize the environment to whatever it is that you need in terms of running your applications. Also, um, th there is a capability built into virtualization platforms, not just ours, but others as well, called live migration that lets you dynamically move running workload without shutting it down. And so there are several ways we could use that in an HPC environment to advantage. Things like bin packing, so rather than placing workload and then having it sit there until it either finishes or you kill it or, or it dies, the ability to actually dynamically move workload around in a large environment like a cloud environment um, is important for getting higher, use, higher efficiency uh, use of your, uh, of your underlying resources. We can also do things like power management and um, preventative maintenance, for example, using those capabilities. Uh, there's also the, the concept of workload isolation, the fact that you're putting your workloads in virtual machines that then allow you to have some degree of security and fault isolation between your workloads, which often turns out to be important, rather than sharing single OS instances. And the use of uh, snapshotting technologies for doing checkpoints, and then as more as a vision statement, being able to use that, use that live migration capability that I just described to essentially do fault avoidance. So if you can detect via telemetry at the hardware level and, and uh, software levels below the application that a uh, piece of hardware may be starting to have problems. If you can do a prediction um, at that level, and there is research uh, ongoing in this area, then we could actually potentially live migrate pieces of your MPI application to nodes before they actually fail and corrupt the bits that represent your application, which would be a lot more efficient ultimately, on, especially on very high scale systems, than taking a full checkpoint of, uh, you know, petabytes or exabytes of, uh, of, uh, of main memory state. So there, uh, I just mentioned this briefly, that there are uh, several use cases um, that seem pretty compelling for using virtualization for HPC. Okay, and, and before I get to the, 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 um, the latency results, just to make this a little bit more concrete, it doesn't, the diagram doesn't really matter. Um, it's just an example of, uh, I wanted to share about a customer, it's a major pharmaceutical customer, uh, global customer that is actually using cloud for HPC, and this, in this case they're using a private cloud. So they're not, um, they're not consuming public resources. But the model that they put in place uh, basically allows researchers in different groups uh, around the company to go to a self-service portal and check out a HPC cluster for use by that research team. And when they check it out, what they get is, a, they don't get a set of physical machines, they get a set of virtual machines. And the virtual machine, so the physical infrastructure that underlies this particular deployment is a set of very big uh, SMP nodes, kind of of the class that John was talking about earlier. These are 80 core systems. And so someone can come in, a, a one research team can come in and say, well, I've got some applications that, you know, they use OpenMP, so they have a certain amount of parallelism. So I'd like, a, you know, a, cl uh, a cluster of eight CPU uh, machines. Uh, another work group might come in and say, well, we're running, say, Blast, and these are all single process, single threaded, so give me a bunch of machines that are you know, single, single CPU machines. Give me 300 of those. So you have the ability to create clusters that match the requirements of the particular applications that you want to use, and then those are packed onto the physical resources by the, by the underlying cloud infrastructure, and then when a research team finishes with their virtual cluster, they give it back and it's recycled, and it turns out that this model actually turns out to be quite uh, popular at this company, and they're deploying multiple instances of this internally. Okay, with that as preamble, uh, so we did a paper uh, which we published, a uh, tech report, uh, we published in April. Uh, I have a, a reference at the end if you'd like to read the whole document. 
This is our first uh, cut at this, so these are preliminary results. Uh, they'll get better over time, but I wanted to share these just in terms of being totally transparent about what works and what doesn't work. So we did simple point-to-point -point test um, using two, uh, two, two socket Westmere class systems. We used uh, QDR and Finiban. Uh, they were direct connected. We weren't using a switch. Uh, it was running Red Hat 6.1. And um, we passed through, um, and I'll talk a little bit about, about what pass through means in a minute. Most of the results, well, you'll see a, a mixture of um, results that are labeled ESXi, that's using our shipping product. And then there are a few that are labeled experimental that involve some patches that we created based on some of the initial analysis that we did. Those patches will appear soon in a, in a release product. Okay, in terms of um, VM direct path IO and pass through mode, I just, I think everyone probably understands this. On the left-hand side, you're seeing a bare metal environment, and this is the way that um, you know, typically InfiniBand users uh, gain high performance, especially low latency in a, in a bare metal environment. You have uh, an RDMA software stack, and then you've got an RDMA-capable piece of hardware, and that allows you to step around the kernel when you're doing, uh, on the data path at least, and you're able to get quite low latencies uh, and high bandwidth um, out of the system by avoiding actually going through the kernel for your data transfers. So on the right-hand side, we're looking at the, the analog in the virtual environment. So in a virtual environment, we, there's still a kernel, except it's the, there are two kernels, actually. There's the guest kernel, which is the, in, our, in, in the cases that I'm reporting here, it's Red Hat 6.1, and then there's the VM kernel, or the hypervisor, as it's typically called. Um, what I'm going to talk about first is the RDMA box on the very far right. So that, that box goes directly from the application to the hardware. Uh, we'll come back and talk about the other one at the very end. Direct analog of kernel bypass in the, in the, um, in the bare metal world. Um, we let the guest have direct access to the, to the InfiniBand hardware. So when we do that, um, we're looking at bandwidth here first. And I think I mentioned earlier, this is all done with RC connections. So the, the, left, the two left-hand curves are looking at send, native and, and uh, virtual and then the two right-hand curves are looking at RDMA read. And as you can see, from a bandwidth perspective, at least over a you know, decent range of message sizes, we're getting bandwidth. And this, to, to us, this was not surprising. We were more concerned to look at the, at the latencies and see how well we would do there. Okay, so now those are really small. So um, this is um, RDMA read using polling for completions, not using interrupts, on the theory that polling is what you're gonna use if you want absolute best latencies. Uh, and what you're seeing is essentially um, uh, the blue line, the bottom line is, is, um, is native, and that's about a 2.28 microsecond, those that can't read that, that chart. Um, and then the, the, uh, the red line above that is our virtual, and it's a 2.98. So we're getting about a, there's about a 0.7 microsecond overhead here, uh, which, you know, depending on how you look at it, from an absolute perspective, not bad. From a relative, you know, percentage perspective, still pretty bad. Right, now how bad that is depends on your application, obviously. It always depends on the application. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we also looked at send receive, and there was a little bit of a blip there, but ignoring the blip for a second, we've talked to Mellanox, we understand what the blip is, and, and we're pretty sure we can smooth that out. Um, then basically what you're seeing in the send receive case is an overhead of about 0.4 microseconds, so a bit better than the other case. So we're, as a starting point, we're pretty happy with this. Um, but we'll be driving this down over time. So, you know, as I said, we can look at microbenchmarks all day, but what really matters is how this performs on, on, um, on real benchmarks. And so um, this is actually an advertisement for some of the work that the Advisory Council does. If people haven't looked at this kind of work on the site, I really recommend it. There are a whole bunch of really, really useful use cases that were done, analyses that were done, looking at different um, HPC ISV applications and really doing a detailed analysis of what their messaging requirements are, what their inter interconnect requirements are, et cetera. Uh, this one is looking at Fluent, and um, again, probably hard to read. Uh, the net, net of this is that uh, Fluent exchanges a lot of different message sizes in a typical run. These are, this is looking on the left and the right at two different simulations. Um, it's a log plot on the, um, on the vertical axis, there are a lot of small messages exchanged here. This is mostly um, collective operations. And then there are a very large range of message sizes uh, for doing the point-to-point -point data transfers. Uh, so 
obviously why this matters, right? So going back and looking at how we're doing in our performance, the collectives are going to fall into an area where, uh, you know, 0.4 microsecond overhead, and um, less. there's going to be less of an issue around point-to-point. -point. Clearly, as you get to large message sizes, it's all about bandwidth and not about latency. So at this point, I have to be really apologetic and say, this is like telling a joke and then forgetting the punchline, because the next slide should show you what our performance is on Fluent, right? Yeah, I don't have that. And so um, the reason I don't have it is that we're working with Intel and we didn't quite meet the deadline to get it done for ISC. Um, I'll be publishing that. I'll, I'll give you a pointer to, our, um, to my blog uh, at the very end of this. We'll be publishing that information there. As a sort of consolation prize, um, I'll give you some sort of related info. Uh, so I would guess, let me, let me back up here. So if I had to guess based on some earlier information that I've seen, I'm gonna guess that those fluent runs are gonna be about a 10 to 15% performance degradation. So whether that's good or bad, again, depends on who you are. If you've got your own bare metal cluster at home and you're able to run at the scale you wanna run at, that's probably unacceptably bad. If you're a user who can't get access to high scale resources and want to rely on a cloud infrastructure and that's the only way you're gonna be able to run your big application, 10 to 15% might not be so bad. Again, you know, and, and that number is gonna vary a lot depending on what your particular application is. Clearly, I can generate even worse numbers by looking at things like Paratech that I think exchange very large numbers of uh, one byte messages. Uh, so again, mileage varies. But so as a consolation prize, I will at least present um, some somewhat older information also generated by Intel, and it is dated. Uh, it's dated in the, in the ways that the red calls out. The processor's a little bit old. It's using DDR InfiniBand. Uh, from my perspective, it's important to point out that this is using, using vSphere 4, which is one major revision back from where we are right now in terms of um, our, our software. And it's also using uh, platform open cluster uh, version 5, which I believe uses Red Hat 5. Red Hat 6, 6.1 6 runs much, much better in a virtualized environment. So as an aside, if any of you are experimenting with virtualization, m make sure you're using the latest kernels for this. Uh, and this was using HPCC. Um, one, three, one. So um, here are the results. Uh, they were run in three different configurations, two nodes, four nodes, eight nodes. You can see the, the, um, uh, the legend over on the right-hand side. Generally speaking, uh, we're doing pretty well. I mean, we're pretty close to what you're looking at is the ratio here of uh, virtual to native. So 1.0 means we're running uh, at the same speed. Uh, anything higher than that means that we're running slower. So I, I didn't... There's only one surprise here for me, and I guess I should talk about, um, so random access, uh, we understand what the issue there is. Um, I'll just briefly say it relates to large pages, uh, and it relates to how memory is virtualized. We can make those numbers come right back down to around 1.0. I have no issue with that. We weren't involved when Intel did this measurement, so we weren't able to give them um, the advice that we would. I honestly have no idea what's going on with uh, naturally ordered ring bandwidth. Um, that's a wacky one to me. I would have expected maybe a latency, um, one of the latency uh, measurements would have been off, but uh, we have to look at that one. So, you know, it's some evidence that, that things that the HPC community care about can run well in a virtualized environment. Okay, so in terms of next steps, well, obviously we need to run Fluent, and uh, we'll, we'll, we will be reporting on that. Uh, we'll be doing that on vSphere 5.x and um, using QDR and Finiban. Uh, FDR, probably not this time, but something useful to look at in the future. Uh, we'll continue to drive latency improvements into our own platform. As I mentioned, this is really just the beginning. We wanted to get a sort of level set on where we stand uh, initially. And um, the last thing that I just I wanted to mention quickly, uh, and I promised I would, was that other RDMA pathway, the one that actually goes through VM kernel. Uh, without going into the technical details, this is another project that's running within the office of the CTO at VMware. And what we're doing is looking at, can we build a device, a virtual device, that gives you RDMA verbs capability at the application level, but integrates with our virtual platform in a way that allows us to maintain all the value that we have in the virtual platform? And what I mean by that is that using the right-hand approach, the full pass-through approach, and going straight to, to bare metal, sorry, bringing the IB device directly up into the guest actually disables a few important things in our platform. So I mentioned live migration earlier, this ability to move uh, applications around. You can't do that if you've, if you've done the pass-through. 
because you've essentially sort of driven a nail right through the, the node and you've pinned the virtual machine down onto the hardware. Um, and you also cannot do snapshots, which we'd like to use for things like um, checkpointing. So by moving to a virtual RDMA device, we'll re-enable those capabilities. So the question that we want to answer this summer is, when we implement this, what do the latencies look like? Do we have an effect on the data path in terms of latencies, and what is that effect? So we expect that some customers will care about that additional latency, or some customers won't care because they're eager enough to get access to those, um, to the live migration and other capabilities. So we'll be reporting on that, that those experiments um, uh, as well. In terms of references, so the full paper that, re that presents the IB results is here. Um, for those that are using virtualization, um, if you're, in, in, it's important to do uh, tuning for uh, running low latency applications on the platform, so I'd recommend the second link. And then for keeping track of what we're doing, uh, you could take a look at the HPC blog there. The fluent results will be put there. There's a lot of other information um, that I haven't talked about here today on things like NUMA, all sorts of um, technical details about running different sorts of HPC applications in a virtual environment. So with that, I'm done. <laughs>